Hey, glad you could make it. It's Bills by the Numbers, presented by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Coming up, we discuss the Bills' expansion of their analytics department and what it means going forward. Former Bill wide receiver TJ Graham joins us to explain why players should apply their own data to their personal game. And we ponder our one burning question. Hey, we don't take a break after minicamp. We will be taking a break after main camp. It's the dead time of the season. We got to get away for a little bit before it starts in earnest. Anybody out there is interested in being a guest on the show. (laughs) Or guest host. Yeah, guest host. (laughs) Happy to have you with us here on Bills by the Numbers. Bills Wall of Famer Steve Tasker and Bills Insider Chris Brown with you as always. And we begin with the decision by the Bills recently to make an addition to their analytics department. They created a new position called Sports Performance Data Analyst. Basically, it's a position that will evaluate all of the on-field and workout data for each player on the roster and help formulate the best course of training for that particular player over the course of a practice week, off-season training, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's an evaluation process that wor- that has worked well for the Bills for pretty much the past three years for sure, maybe even longer than that as far as we know, but they've apparently decided let's try to enhance it even further here. Yeah, and it's meant – Ostensibly, that they've been healthier than than other teams have. Yeah. They have had fewer guys on IR, and I and I I've said it a couple of times that this team hit the playoffs last year healthier than anybody, playing better than anybody. Uh, it was right where they wanted to be, and that starts uh, with analytics and having data. These guys all wear every team wears GPS monitors. They know how how much the guys run, how much every guys run, how fast, you know how what their pulse rate was. They've got a lot of analytical data about what these guys are doing physically out on the field, and they're starting to get a handle on how they can make them optimize that on Sunday for game day. Yeah, I I think the most important development here, because I think the Bills, for for the better part of the last 12 years, have had GPS-monitored data in the practice setting. Only recently has the NFL allowed that kind of tracking in games in the last couple of years. But I think the more important thing here is they found a way to effectively apply all that information to benefit the players on an individual basis. And as you said, Steve, it's one of the reasons why they have one of the healthiest rosters in football in each of the last three years. It also makes a difference that you got a coaching staff and a head coach in particular who listens and sits guys down for practice. Um, Not only – have the Bills been healthy, they've also been healthy enough to practice. You know, used to be, man, in my generation, it was like, wow, forget the guy, can he get ready to play on Sunday? The Bills have been good enough that not only these guys playing on Sunday and playing very well, they're also practicing to play better on Sunday. They practice hard. They practice hard and they practice effectively, and they're on the field during the week. They're not just sitting around waiting to get healthy so that they can suit up on Sunday and play the game. Uh, The way they have done it, in here in Buffalo in Orchard Park has been that not only have they been able to play at a high level, they've also been able to prepare to play well. And that is as important as anything. The Bills subscribe heavily to preventative maintenance, but they don't depend on it, which is why Brandon Bean and his pro personnel department have gone to extraordinary lengths to backfill the roster with veteran players that have experience. This has especially been the case on the offensive and defensive lines where he's lined the roster with capable reserves should injury strike. Is this Bean just doing everything he can to eliminate pitfalls that can derail a team from achieving the ultimate goal? That's some of it, no question. But I think also it, when you have depth, and particularly veteran depth, and you sign guys to a one-year deal, so those guys are, I think as a veteran player, you become keenly aware of how valuable every season is. Mm-hmm. And we hear all the time about competition, keeping these guys sharp and bringing guys in who want to play. And if you've got a veteran guy who comes in, signs a one-year deal, he wants to get on the field and prove how good he can be. That means he's practicing harder. That means he's getting ready to trying to push his way onto the field through his performance. And if there's somebody ahead of him, that somebody ahead of him better be keeping up with that. So I think when you bring veteran depth onto your roster – those guys have the ability to raise the level of the back end of the roster by saying, listen, i got to get ready to play. I want to be ready to play. I want to get on the field because 
you know, I'm, I want to make the team. I want to make the team, and I want to get on the field, and I want to get another contract. I want to, I want to get on the field and prove my worth to another team or this team. These one-year contracts that Brandon Bean also does are huge to keep guys motivated, saying, "Listen, if I'm going to do this right. again, uh, I got to push my way onto the field," and that means some pretty intense practices and some pretty intense competition at positions. Any steps you can take to improve your chances of avoiding a disastrous turn of events in the course of a season, you do it. Ask any GM, and they'll say yes, yes, and yes. And that's what Bean's doing. He's enhancing the sports science side of the equation to keep the roster healthy, expanding you know, the analytics department. But in the event, it's, it's not with what he calls you – know, I mean, it's, it's not going to prevent what he calls the car crash – type injuries you know a broken leg right. that has nothing to do with sports science it's it has more to do with the barbaric nature of the game so much like their sports science philosophy what they've done with the roster is preventative maintenance too. maintain the strength of the on-field product by creating a deeper roster and for preventative maintenance to truly add up you need players subscribing to that approach right. fully. We heard Von Miller say at a press conference this past week that he does anything and everything to treat his body right. Massages, cryotherapy, acupuncture, nutrition. He does it all. But this goes back to the Bills personnel department only bringing in players with the right DNA. And that includes being committed to doing everything you can do to be physically ready to play, right? Yeah, and we've seen it in some of the young players, particularly the, the guys that – uh, you know, they put more assets into high draft picks. Boogie Basham came back this year. He looks different. Greg, Rousse 12 pounds. Greg Rousseau looks different. Uh, in years past, um, A.J. Epinesa, he looks different. You know, these guys that they have drafted high in the draft have come in, and if they've needed to, they have transformed themselves. Um, so it's those kind of guys who come in, buy in, and also uh, use, you know, treat their – professional careers as a lifestyle rather than a career they become a guy who eats right all the time they yeah. become a guy who works out all the time who watches what he does in the off season, uh who's always on conscious of how this is going to affect his athletic ability and, and his preparation for the season so you, we've seen it with a lot of the guys they drafted high in the draft with them transforming their bodies and changing their games Dawson Knox did a nice job of it as well uh, not so much on the preventative maintenance but you can see the mindset when he comes back and as a rookie dropped a bunch of balls now he doesn't yeah it's nothing but hard work it's that kind of attitude and getting better the the thirst to get better and to maintain and to keep get going and going and going that sets all these guys apart and that's what they scout for crazy thing is a decade ago you had players on this roster who would just try to make weight so they wouldn't get fined they wouldn't eat for two days you know what i mean like something right. like that right now, not optimal. it takes a much greater commitment to take all the steps the Bills ask of their players with their preventative maintenance program. If you shortchange yourself, you shortchange the, the team. And I think that's why Buffalo is only interested in players who will invest the resources that they provide in themselves, which subsequently helps the team. Time now for the numbers game where we will use injury information to find out which teams had the highest number of players on injured reserve at the end of the season last year. So, Steve, can you name six of the top ten teams that had the most players on injured reserve last season? Fire it up. What do you got? All right, Baltimore. Baltimore is on the list. Tied for second. San Francisco. 14 players on Some, injured San reserve. San Francisco. San Francisco had 12. Tied for sixth. Tennessee. Tennessee had 14. Tied with Baltimore. Three for three. Steve. Arizona. Arizona is at the bottom of the list, but they're there. They had 10. Okay, how many have I got? I've got four now. You've got four. You may have to go for a sweep here. I only asked for six. I will say Carolina. They are not on the list. Your first miss. That was a gap. That was, oh, wait, no. Most players on injured reserve at the end of the 2021 season. So far, you have Baltimore. And Tennessee, both at 14. San Francisco with 12. And Arizona with 10. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh was just below the cut line <sighs> at 9. Minnesota. Minnesota with 12. Yes. Tied for 6 at San Francisco. I got one more. Get me one more and you're uh, home free. Chicago. Uh, no. 
Chicago was not on the list. They were pretty healthy last year. Only seven on IR. Cincinnati. No again. Yeah, it's hard to do that because they, they had such a good season. It's hard to have a good yes. season. You look at the teams that struggled. Uh, so, so would we, uh, see, Seattle. Uh, Seattle is not on, <sighs> not on there either. I need the last one. Hold on. I need one more, Steve. You got five hits and five misses. <laughs> I was so good too. Yeah, you were out of the game. Uh, Hot. Who was who was a bad team? Jacksonville. Jacksonville not in the top ten. Yeah, I'm grasping they, they at straws were just, now. I'm just starting. outside. Oh, New Orleans. Um, no. So here's the situation. Uh, I'll I'll go from the bottom to the top. So you mentioned Arizona with ten players on IR. These next five teams also had. 10 players on IR. Indy, Houston, Denver, the Jets, and Miami. Then San Francisco and Minnesota at 12, which you mentioned. With 14, Baltimore, Tennessee, Washington, and Detroit Mm. were the two other teams tied for second. And then in the number one spot, with an astounding 21 players on injured reserve last year, the New York Giants. Really? 21. I was stunned. I didn't think anybody was going to beat Baltimore. For that year. couldn't believe it. I wonder. You, you wonder if Dayball can take some of what they did here. He they better. Had, yeah, right. He better. That seems like something he could bring to the table. Because that is an utter disaster. 21 players yeah, on IR. That's bad. That's half your starting roster. Woo! I mean, half your you know game day roster. Yeah, that's that's something else. Yeah, that's All right, not bad, Steve. Right now, new customers can get their first bet risk-free up to $1,000. Just sign up today by going to sportsbook.fanduel.com or by downloading the FanDuel Sportsbook app. FanDuel Sportsbook, an official partner of the Buffalo Bills. We expand this discussion as it pertains to the health of the players with former Bills wide receiver TJ Graham, who recently wrote a piece urging current players to own their data because it can be used against you. Here's TJ. All right, TJ, so let's start here. Currently, the head of performance and on-field application, TJ, you obviously see how players and clubs are learning how to take all that information and apply it to the game or the individual player. When you were here, I think that GPS tracking data was like in its infancy. Um, In what ways would you say it's most different now compared to back then? Uh, well, it was definitely in, in its infancy then, you know, just even like the evolution of the iPhone, it's changed so much in the past like 10, 12 years that like even the catapult GPS units weren't even available at the time. And the metrics you could pull from a GPS unit can help you tailor your whole output as a player. And just understanding that to that analytical degree can actually give longevity to you, your playing career as long as on your life. And just kind of understanding those metrics and piecing those numbers together to put together to create a human version of yourself. Kind of how where, how uh, would a team are. how would a team use this against a player uh, as you're talking about you know what I mean because the teams you you're, you're asking you know what I mean uh, so, so a player owns well, that data how would it help him and how would a team use it in their benefit? Well, you guys know me well. I had a track career, right? A very track yep. heavy, heavy track background. But if you're kind of trying to tell yourself to run like nine five, you know, day in and day out, you got to kind of justify every workout and hit those measurables right and the same thing can happen in football where day in and day out a player is hitting those types of numbers and they need to fine tune their output now a team can use those numbers to kind of justify whether a guy is giving an optimal output or not and they have a baseline um, idea of you know how fast he runs how far he runs how well he does in practice and he's kind of sloughing off you know that's indication that he's probably not in shape not doing as well as he should but as a player you take that information and you kind of, you know, create longevity for your career, you know, fine tune your output. Right. And then with that track background, TJ, even back when you were playing and this stuff was just kind of coming online for football, I have to imagine very quickly for you, you were probably ahead of the curve just from your track background, knowing the value that information has before anybody in the NFL was even putting that data into an application process, right? So did you try to cross-reference that at all, even when you were a player going back to some of your track roots? 
I did. I did. So like while I was training, I started getting to the point of just measuring certain drills that I was doing in the off season to kind of get an idea of whether or not next season I need to improve on that, how to improve where it was last year. Um, even within routes too, like, uh, currently I'm just measuring GPS load and route. So even speed between two cones within like a post corner or so, and using that to kind of understand how fast a person is efficiently running within route progression and stuff. Um, but that, that being very high level, the use of technology and data has definitely set it over the top. You know, before it's a lot of eyeball tests, uh, stopwatch type of stuff. But because technology has advanced so far in the last 10 to 12 years, you know, we're able to use a lot of number of other things. Like, for instance, for Breakaway, um, we're doing um, GPS stuff, but also we're doing biomechanics in a 240 hertz per second camera system with eight cameras that captures 3D triangulation and angles of your movements that are next level cutting edge type of stuff. So just being able to break your body mechanics down to like your toe. <laughs> yeah. What, so. it, what is the, I know coaches, you know, have, have been some, some of them slower the other than others. And some of them have embraced it quickly and, and use it as part of their protocols to get their teams ready. What is, uh, what is there for a, a coach or a coaching staff in this? I, obviously, is it more than just saying, okay, this guy's really working hard we like what this guy's doing. Is it more than that, or is there something else that can help a team be play better or be better prepared? Well, if you're not measuring, you're not getting any better, right? Let's just, just start with that. You know, we use statistics already in football to kind of justify down and distance, you know, play call, uh, predictability. We, we already do it for the X and O's. Now just go ahead and do it for the player in the body, right? We still need bodies. We're not to robots yet. Hopefully we're never there. But at the same time right now, we have players and they're humans. So basically helping a player understand and track themselves can actually help with the predictability of how they're going to play in practice tomorrow. Uh, just sitting in some of the meetings recently uh, with the, the Packers that I was just interning with, um, just listening to the strength condition coach mention like some guys are in the red, some guys are in the orange, just kind of saying how much they've worked that day and how to tailor tomorrow's practice to fit that. You know, we can't keep loading guys up with two a days and three days, you know, we, even if we did those, we could use data and technology to kind of justify how much output or how much we're working the guys. You know, I think that's important from the coaching standpoint, too, because there's a fine line between a tough guy and an idiot. Right. And it's a fine line that you should teeter totter because, you know, you're going to be a tough team. But on the other side of that could be injury, it could be hurt, it could be something that's, you know, negative towards your team. So kind of understanding data and measuring to get better to kind of, you know, just toe that line keep safe, uh, safety high and output high as well. The Bills have really moved things forward since Coach McDermott got here in 2017. I mean, they believe in preventative maintenance. They call it prehab. They want to keep players on the field and available, just like every team does. But they do have things individualized and tailored to each specific player. And over the last three years, they've had one of the lowest injury rates in the league. Are the just in the in the world in which you work now, TJ? Are the Bills kind of known in circles as one of the teams that maybe operates on the cutting edge in this area? They are. So just the fact that they're individualized and tailored to each player is next level. You know, usually we just throw in blanket ideas over a team because there's a lot of bodies. It's a hard it's a hard task to kind of individualize 90 guys in the off season, 50, 63 guys in the uh, season, you know, it's kind of a difficult task unless you hire someone internally to kind of fine tune and detail that. And, you know, the bills have definitely shown their worth by, you know, initiating the prehab type of idea, um, just kind of being ahead of things. And I think being ahead of stuff is exactly where we need to be and kind of losing the old school mentality, but also still applying those old school principles of work hard, but let's just work smarter. Is there any guys, or do you know of a, a trend now, particularly with these guys that are getting together in the off season, how the off season has become, well, just part of the deal. I mean, you're uh, guys are, it's a year round job. It's a lifestyle. Is there a move towards these guys doing this themselves as well? Get, getting the GPS, wearing it when they work out, doing that. And, or do the, you know, certainly there's some personal trainers who probably use some of this as well. Are guys getting on this themselves individually in their off season workouts? They are. So the more that it's been available, the more that, you know, I've been speaking as well and communicating with different players, realizing that there's opportunities to own your own data, you know, just own it. It's connectivity from your season to your off season and back around. You just said it, that it's a full-time job. So not having a distance between your team and your off season training is kind of where we are. Like Breakaway, we have an app that actually houses all of your data. It ingests your data from your team. It also ingests your data from your own personal health stuff it also takes in stuff from your training in the off season kind of connecting the full thing 
and creating like an athlete persona just off of numbers. You know, if you put all these numbers together, it's an athlete, it's a person, you know, it's just a matter of aggregating and like putting it all together so that, you know, someone can understand it in a very digestible language. So why don't you spell this out for us, TJ? Where do you kind of hope Breakaway goes here? I mean, is it a company that's reached critical mass here or are you guys still working towards that? Where do you kind of hope you guys are in three to five years? Well, we want every football player in the NFL on the app. Uh, we've already had site partnerships with the NFL PA to be the official data provider for NFL players. Um, we're on that ta- on that track. Uh, we're also rolling out other sports, NBA, WNBA, um, European soccer, uh, golf is up next, track and field is up. It's just a matter of getting enough technology around and just creating a space for athletes to place that. You know, in our application, we have spots for video uh, we have spots for just data analysis. We have spots for just your health information, spots for your stats, pulling PFF data. Um, it's a it's an abundant amount of resources you can kind of put together to kind of just tailor make it to fit yourself. Kind of you're saying with the builder doing individual skill sets, yeah. individual yeah. analysis. Well, TJ, it's interesting stuff. It's a lot of fun, and I know that it's made a lot of football players <laughs> lengthen their career and be have, be more productive during it. Um, it's all science fiction to me when my career, this was all, you know what I mean? It, it's it, right. So, yeah. um, yeah, it was like the only dan- analytics they had were, how do you feel today? And I was like, pretty good. And that was about it. <laughs> we actually so, had that question. That's our first question. How do you feel today? That's one of the most important questions. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. That's all we had back then. We had no numbers to back it up. Yeah. But even though you might say that the data might say different, like, Hey, you better back this guy off today or he's going right. to yank a hamstring <laughs> or something. But TJ, look, thanks. Exactly. Thanks very much for the time. It was great to catch up with you. Good luck with breakaway yes, uh, in the future here. We, uh, we hope to hear that name surface more and more in the coming years in the NFL, because this is an expanding industry. I know I don't have to tell you that, but cool to catch up with you. Glad you're heavily invested in it. We'll keep an eye out for you down the line here. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Steve. You guys have a good one. Go Bills. We turn now to our one burning question. Which do we believe, Steve, will be more difficult for the Bills in 2022? Running the table in the division or coming out of the first seven games with five victories. You know right. the schedule right. at the front is, yeah. is pretty challenging. Rams, Titans, Dolphins, Ravens, Steelers, Chiefs, Green Bay. But I still so think... Which is harder? Running the table in the division, going 6-0, and or going 5-2 and in those first seven games? I think it'll be harder to go five and two in those first you do. seven games. Yeah, why? Because the Bills' division is still rebuilding around them. Certainly, the Jets will be a little better. I think Zach Wilson's going to play a little better, but they're still rebuilding. They're, uh, and I don't think they have the horses to to beat this team. Miami, same thing. Brand new head coach. I think they'll it'll take them some time. And and quite frankly, I don't think their quarterback is up to it. And then of course, New England. Um, they don't seem to have improved at all in this offseason, and the Bills absolutely handed them their own head at the end of the season there this last go. year. So, yeah, I think it'll be easier to – and I get it. I mean, they could win the division without sweeping it. I get it. You're talking about going 6-0 and in the division. Yeah. They only lost one game last year, and they – And they ran the table in 20. And they did run the table in 20. So I, I would say, yeah, it's more likely. I don't think either one of these scenarios is really, really likely. Yeah. But if you had to pick one. But if I had to pick one, I'd, I'd say the AFC East getting swept by the Bills would be the most likely. Yeah, it's a tough one for me because, you know, division games always seem to be yeah, more of a heavy lift for some reason. It's a grinded out kind of game sometimes. You know, some, somehow you, they know you the best. They can get you off your game the easiest. Well, maybe not the easiest. And I'll say this too. Both teams show up fully prepared and on it. They're hard to beat right. teams that are really – Especially the invested. second time around. Right. What, no matter how the first time went. Um, the, it's hard to win a division game because both teams realize the importance of it and, quite frankly, the emotional content's there for both teams. Yeah. But with all the newness that the rest of the division has, right. I mean, the Jets are going to have a ton of young players on the field again this year. The Patriots have a brand-new offensive coordinator, and I don't think the loss of Josh McDaniels can be adequately quantified. I think it is the most glaring loss that that roster has suffered it's there is no player loss that equals the loss of josh mcdaniels in my mind 
for the New England Patriots. That is going to be a heavy lift on the offensive side of the ball for a second-year quarterback who's going to be working with some coordinator we do not know yet who does not have a lot of play-calling experience on the offensive side of the ball. And then Miami, new coaching staff, new host of weapons. They're all very exciting, but you got to pull all that together with a brand-new offensive and defensive scheme with guys yeah. that haven't played in it before. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm going to kind of side with you here and say – running the table in the division is probably more likely than going five and two in the first seven, which I know may be startling to some Bills fans. Like, what? What do you mean they're not going to go five and two in the first seven? Look at the opponents. Right. I mean, even though you've got some opponents in those first seven weeks, Steve, that maybe have fallen back to the pack a little bit, Tennessee, for example, maybe even Kansas City, you know, sure. swapping out Tyreek Hill. Yes, they have Juju Smith-Schuster, Marquez, Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Pittsburgh has probably fallen back to the pack just because of the quarterback situation. So you could say you could find your way to five wins pretty easily, but we're still talking about some class of the league type teams there. Rams and Packers, and you know then you got the a the AFC North. Ravens should have yeah. a big fat chip on their shoulder after the way last year went. Maybe Miami is sick and tired of getting it handed to them by Josh and the Bills. Maybe they're fired up in a given week. You never know. Yeah, I I. Yeah, but I still think you, you go down that li you go down that list. Five and two is hard. Yeah, five and two is hard. Now, I'm not saying so. You would say four and three. You'd you'd be pretty. Yeah, you'd take I've, that. I've said that. Yeah, and yeah. I think four and three because the rest of the the rest of the schedule. I mean, you're going through Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago. I mean, I'll take that. And I'll tell you this too. I, I'm not high on Cincinnati this year. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah, you got that now. New England twice. Now, New England obviously is going to walk into the games with Buffalo with a huge chip on their shoulder. I don't know if it's going to make that much difference. I, I like to see them play, see how they're playing. Yeah. But, man, oh, man, for right now, New England's an afterthought. Yeah. Our final figure puts an exclamation point on preventative maintenance and sports science to keep your roster healthy. The combined one-loss record. Of the five teams that Steve tried to guess with the highest number of players on injured reserve in 2021 was 34 and 50. Only one of those teams, the Titans, made the playoffs. No other team besides the Titans had more than eight wins last season. Got to stay healthy if you want to win games. That'll do it for this episode. Be sure to subscribe so you know when the next edition is ready for you. And remember, when you need to know about the Bills, you need to check Bills by the Numbers. For Steve Tasker, I'm Chris Brown. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time, everybody.